Good night. We are on Thursday, the 27th of July, 2023. However, I'm going to be looking backwards. I already wrote it in my book that I write up the um, videos that I make. And I'm going back to the 25th of July. I'm going to be sharing with you Butler's The Lives of the Saints. I'm going to do all of them. I haven't selected any in particular, but I have written their names down, so I plan to re read them to you. We can learn a lot from the lives of the saints. If you have a saint's name, you were baptized, and you need prayers answered, intercede. Ask your own saint whose name you have to intercede for you in those issues and you will find answers. You will get answers to prayers. They're there in the church, they're in heaven and they're praying for us and especially for you if you have their name. So I won't waste any time chatting in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Angel of God, my guardian dear, to whom God's love entrusts me here, ever this night be at my side, to light and guard, to rule and guide. Amen. And we pray to and for and through the saints and for the faithful departed. Eternal rest grant to them, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon them. May they rest in peace. Amen. Holy Michael Archangel, defend me in this day of battle. Be my safeguard against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke them, I humbly pray, and do thou, Prince of the heavenly host, by the power of God, thrust down to hell Satan and all the wicked evil spirits who wander through the world for the ruin of souls. Amen. I'm going to make sure I have this microphone as near as possible because... I've, it's on a lot of folders and I don't want it to tip off. <laughs> so I uh, will begin with St. James the Greater Apostle, AD 44. I might sometimes be picking the book up and other times I'll be putting it down depending how heavy it is. So I hope you can hear me. I can't do anything uh, other than have it as near as it is. St. James the Great Apostle, A.D. 44. St. James, the brother of St. John Evangelist, son of Zebedee, was called the Greater to distinguish him from the other apostle of the same name, surnamed the Less, because he was the younger. St. James the Greater was by birth a Galilean, and by trade a fisherman with his father and brother, living probably at Bethsaida, where St. Peter also dwelt at that time. Jesus, walking by the lake of Genesareth, saw Peter and Andrew fishing, and he called them to come after him, promising to make them fishers of men. Going a little farther on the shore, he saw two other brothers, James and John, in a ship with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he also called them, who forthwith left their nets and their father and followed him, probably by conversing with Peter, their townsman, and by other means, they had before this call a conviction that Jesus was the Christ and no sooner did they hear his invitation and felt the divine will directing them but the same moment they quitted all things to answer this summons. St. James was present with his brother St. John and St. Peter at the cure of Peter's mother-in-law and the raising of the daughter of Jairus from the dead. And in the same year, 
Jesus formed the company of his apostles, into which he adopted James and John. He gave these two the surname of Boanerges, or Sons of Thunder, seemingly on account of an impetus spirit and a fiery temper. For example, when a town of the Samaritans refused to entertain Christ, they suggested that he should call down fire from heaven to consume it. But our Redeemer gave them to understand that meekness and patience were the arms by which they were to conquer. You know not of what spirit you are. The Son of Man came not to destroy souls, but to save. But the instruction and example of the Son of God did not fully enlighten the understanding of the apostles, nor purify their hearts until the Holy Ghost had shed his, shed his light upon them. Their virtue was still imperfect, as appeared when the mother of James and John, imagining that he was going to set up a temporal monarchy according to the notion of the Jews concerning the Messiah, asked him that her two sons, might sit the one on his right hand and the other on his left in his kingdom. The two sons of Zebedee spoke by the mouth of their mother as well as by their own, but Christ directed his answer to them, telling them they knew not what they asked, for in his kingdom Preferments are attainable not by the forward and ambitious, but by the most humble, the most laborious, and the most patient. He therefore asked them if they were able to drink of his cup of suffering. The two apostles, understanding the condition under which Christ offered them his kingdom and ardent for his sake, without hesitation answered, We can! Our Lord told them they should indeed have their portion of suffering. But he could not make no other disposal of the honours of his kingdom than according to the proportion of everyone's charity and patience in suffering. The Son of Man also is not come to be ministered to, but to minister and to give his life a redemption for many. Nevertheless, those apostles who from time to time acted impetuously and had to be rebuked were the very ones whom our Lord turned to on special occasions. Peter, and this James and John alone, were admitted to be spectators of his glorious transfiguration and they alone were taken to the innermost recesses of Gethsemane on the night of agony and bloody sweat at the beginning of his passion. Where St. James preached and spread the gospel after the Lord's ascension, we have no account from the writers of the first ages of Christianity. According to the tradition of Spain, he made an evangelizing visit to that country. But the earliest known reference to this is only in the later part of the 7th century and then in an Oriental, not a Spanish source. St. Julian of Toledo himself resolutely rejected this alleged visit of the apostle to his country 
At no time has the tradition been unanimously received and there are grave arguments against it. For example, in St. Paul's letter to the Romans, XV 20 and 24, St. James was the first among the apostles who had the honour to follow his divine master by martyrdom which he suffered at Jerusalem under King Herod Agrippa I, who inaugurated a persecution of Christians in order to please the Jews. Clement of Alexandria and from him Eusebius relate that his accuser, observing the courage and constancy of mind wherewith the apostle underwent his trial, was so impressed that he repented of what he had done, declared himself a Christian and was condemned to be beheaded as they were both led together to execution. He begged pardon of the apostle for having apprehended him. The Holy Scriptures simply say that Agrippa killed James, the brother of John with the sword, Acts X 112. He was buried at Jerusalem, but again, according to the tradition of Spain, dating from about 830, the body was translated or moved first to Iria Flavia, now El Padron in Galatia, about and then to Compostela, where during the Middle Ages, the shrine of Santiago became one of the greatest of all Christian shrines. The relics still rest in the cathedral and were referred to as authentic authentic in a bull of Pope Leo XIII in 1884. Their genuineness is seriously disputed, but it does not depend in any way on the truth or falseness of the story of St. James' missionary visit to Spain. And there's quite a lot of small writing of a very tiny font which I cannot read. So we're now moving on to the next saint. They are known, but he is a martyr and his name is Christopher, Saint Christopher. Christopher, before his baptism, was named Reprobus, but afterwards he was named Christopher, which is as much as to say as bearing Christ. For that he bare Christ in four manners. He bare him on his shoulders by conveying and leading in his body, by making it lean in mind by devotion, and in his mouth by confession and preaching. Christopher was of the lineage of the Canaanites, and he was of a right great stature, and had a terrible and fearful face and appearance. And he was twelve cubits of length, and as it read in some histories, that when he served and dwelled with the king of Canaan, it came in his mind that he would seek the greatest prince that was in the world, and him would he serve and obey. And as far as he went, that he came to a right great kin, king, of whom the renown generally was, that he was the greatest of the world. And when the king saw him, he received him into his service and made him to dwell in his court. Upon a time, a minstrel sang before him a song in which he named oft the devil. And the king, who was a Christian man, when he heard him name the devil, made anon the sign of the cross on his visage and when Christopher saw that, he had a great marvel what sign it was, and wherefore the king made it, and he demanded of him, 
And because the king would not say, he said, If thou tell me not, I shall no longer dwell with thee. And then the king told him, saying, Alway when I hear the devil named, I fear that he should have power over me, and I garnish me with this sign that he grieve me not nor annoy me. Then Christopher said to him, Doubtest thou the devil that he hurt thee? Then is the devil more mighty and greater than thou art? I am then deceived of my hope and purpose, for I supposed I had found the most mighty and the most greatest Lord in the world. But I commend thee to God, for I will go seek him, for to be my Lord and I his servant. And then he departed from this king and hasted him for to seek the devil. And as he went by a great desert, he saw a great company of knights, of which a knight cruel and horrible came to him, and demanded whither he went. And Christopher answered him and said, I go to seek the devil for to be my master. And he said, I am he that thou seekest. And then Christopher was glad and bound him to be his servant perpetual, and took him for his master and lord. And as they went together by a common way, they found there a cross erect and standing. And anon, as the devil saw the cross, he was afeard and fled, and he left the right way, and brought Christopher about by a sharp desert. And after that, when they were past the cross, he brought him to the highway that they had left. And when Christopher saw that, he marvelled and demanded whereof he doubted and had left the high and fair way and had gone so far about so rough a desert and the devil would not tell him in no wise. Then Christopher said to him, If thou wilt not tell me, I shall anon depart from thee, and shall serve thee no more. Wherefore the devil was constrained to tell him, and said, There was a man called Christ, which was hanged on the cross, and when I see his sign, I am sore afraid, and flee from it, wheresoever I see it. To whom Christopher said, Then he is greater, and more mightier than thou. When thou art afraid of his sign, and I see well that I've laboured in vain when I've not found in the greatest Lord of the world, and I will serve thee no longer. Go thy way then, for I will go seek Christ. And when he'd long sought and demanded where he should find Christ at last, he came into a great desert to an hermit that dwelt there, and this hermit preached to him, of Jesus Christ, and informed him in the faith diligently, and said to him, This king whom thou desirest to serve requireth the service that thou must oft fast. And Christopher said to him, Require of me some other thing, and I shall do it, for that which thou requirest I may not do. And the hermit said, Thou must then wake and make many prayers. And Christopher said to him, I wot not what that is. I may do no such thing. And then the hermit said to him, Knowest thou such and such a river, where many be perished and lost? To whom Christopher said, I know it well. Then, said the hermit, Because thou art noble, and high of stature, and strong in thy members, Thou shalt be resident by that river, and thou shalt bear over all of them that shall pass there, which shall be a thing right pleasing to our Lord Jesus Christ, whom thou desirest to serve, and I hope he shall show himself to thee. Then, said Christopher, certainly this service may I well do, and I promise to him for to do it. Then went Christopher to this river and made there a dwelling place for himself and bare a great pole in his hand instead of a staff by which he sustained himself in the water 
and bear over all manner of people without ceasing. And there he abode, thus doing many days. And in a time as he slept in his lodge, he heard the voice of a child which called to him and said, Christopher, come out and bear me over. Then he awoke and went out, but found no man. And when he was again in his house, he heard the same voice, and he ran out and found nobody. The third time he was called and came thither, and found a child beside the edge of the river, which prayed him goodly to bear him over the water. And then Christopher lift up the child on his shoulders and took up his staff and entered into the river for to pass. And the water of the river arose and swelled more and more and the child was heavy as lead. And always as he went farther, the water increased and grew more and the child more and more waxed heavy insomuch that Christopher had great anguish and was afeard to be drowned. And when he was escaped with great pain and passed the water and set the child aground, he said to this child, Child, thou hast put me in great peril. Thou weighest almost as I had all the world upon me. I might bear no greater burden. And the child answered, Christopher, marvel thee nothing, for thou hast not only borne all the world upon thee, but thou hast borne him that created and made all the world upon thy shoulders. I am Jesus Christ, the King whom thou servest in this work. And because that thou know what I say to be the truth, set thy staff in the earth by thy house, and thou shalt see tomorrow that it shall bear flowers and fruit. And anon he vanished from his eyes. And then Christopher set his staff in the earth, and when he arose on the morn, he found his staff, like a palm tree, bearing flowers, leaves and dates. And then Christopher went into the city of Lycia and understood not their language. Then he prayed our Lord that he might understand them. And so he did. And as he was in his prayer, the judges supposed that he'd been a fool and left him there. And then when Christopher understood the language, he covered his visage and went to the place where they martyred Christian men and comforted them in our Lord. And then the judges smote him in the face and Christopher said to them, If I were not a Christian, I should avenge mine injury. And then Christopher pitched his rod in the earth and prayed to our Lord that for to convert the people it might bear flowers and fruit. And anon it did so. And then he converted 8,000 men. And then the king sent two knights for to fetch him. And they found him praying and durst not tell him so. And anon, after the king sent as many more, and anon they set them down for to pray with him. And when Christopher arose, he said to them, What seek ye? And when they saw him in the visage, they said to him, The king hath sent us that we should lead thee bound unto him. And Christopher said to them, If I would, ye should not lead me to him, bound or unbound. And they said to him, If thou wilt go thy way, go quit where thou wilt, and we shall say to the king that we have not found thee. 
It shall not be so, said he, but I shall go with you. And then he converted them in the faith and commanded them that they should bind his hands behind his back and lead him so bound to the king. And when the king saw him, he was afeard and fell down off the seat. And his servants lifted him up again. And then the king inquired his name and his country. And Christopher said to him, Before I was baptised, I was named a re reprobus, and after, I am Christopher. Before baptism, a Canaanite, now a Christian man. To whom the king said, Thou hast a foolish name, that is to wit, of Christ crucified, who could not help himself and may not profit to thee. How therefore, thou cursed Canaanite, why wilt thou not do sacrifice to our gods? To whom Christopher said, Thou art rightfully called Dagnus, for thou art the death of the world and the fellow of the devil, and thy gods be made with the hands of men. And the king said to him, Thou wert nourished among wild beasts, and therefore thou mayest not say, but wild language and words unknown to men. And if thou wilt do sacrifice to the gods, I shall give to thee great gifts and great honours, and if not, I shall destroy thee and consume thee by great pains and torments. But for all this he would in no wise do sacrifice. Wherefore he was sent into prison, and the king did behead the other knights that he had sent for him, whom he had converted. And after this he sent into the prison to St. Christopher two fair women, of whom one was named Nicaea and the other Aquilina, and promised to them many great gifts if they could draw Christopher to sin with them. And when Christopher saw that, he set him down in prayer, and when he was constrained by them that embraced him to move, he arose and said, What seek ye? For what cause be ye come hither? And they, which were afraid of his appearance and clearness of his visage, said, Holy Saint of God, have pity on us so that we may believe in that God that thou preachest. And when the king heard that, he commanded that they should be let out and brought before him, to whom he said, Ye be deceived, but I swear to you by my gods that if ye do no sacrifice to my gods, ye shall anon perish by evil death. And they said to him, If thou wilt that we shall do sacrifice, command that the places may be clean, and that all the people may assemble at the temple. And when this was done, they entered into the temple and took their girdles and put them about the necks of the gods and drew them to the earth and brake them all in pieces and said to them that were there, Go and call the physicians and leeches for to heal your gods. And then, by commandment of the king, Aquilina was hanged and a right great and heavy stone was hanged at her feet, so that her members were most piteously broken. And when she was dead and passed to our Lord, her sister Nicaea was cast into a great fire, but she issued out without harm, all whole. And then they made to smite off her head, and so suffered death. After this, Christopher was brought before the king, and the king commanded that he should be beaten with rods of iron, and that there should be set upon his head a cross of iron, red-hot and burning. And then after he had made a seat of iron, and had Christopher bound thereon, and after fire set under it and cast therein pitch, but the seat melted like wax and Christopher issued out without any harm or hurt and when the king saw that 
He commanded that he should be bound to a strong stake and that he should be through shotten with arrows by forty knights' archers. But none of the knights might attain him. For the arrows hung in the air about nigh him without touching. Then the king weaned that he had been through shotten by the arrows of the knights and dressed him for to go to him. And one of the arrows returned suddenly from the air and smote him in the eye and blinded him. To whom Christopher said, Tyrant, I shall die tomorrow. Make a little clay mixed with my blood and anoint therewith thine eye and thou shalt receive health. Then by the commandment of the king, he was led for to be beheaded and then there and there made he his orison, and his head was smitten off, and so suffered martyrdom. And the king then took a little of his blood, and laid it on his eye, and said, In the name of God, and of Saint Christopher, and was anon healed. Then the king believed in God, and gave commandment that if any person blamed God or Saint Christopher, he should be anon be slain with the sword. I'll have to read the next few words. They're a little small, but they're not as small as what's below it. That with a few verbal alterations is the story of Saint Christopher from the Golden Legend. I've never heard this till I've read it just now. I've, it's quite a surprise to me. As put into English by William Caxton, a story no known all over Christendom, both East and West. Well, I must be ignorant because I've never heard this before unless I've heard it in childhood and forgotten it. But it's not likely to be forgotten once heard, is it? From it arose the popular belief that he who looked on an image of the saint should not that day suffer harm. I know about St Christopher, but not this story. So this maybe is the one then. A belief that was responsible for the putting of large statues or frescoes representing him opposite the doors of churches, some of which remain in our own country, Great Britain, England. A belief um, so that all who entered might see it. He was the saint, patron saint of travellers, yet so this is the one that we've had little um, medals from and was invoked against perils from water, tempests and plagues. And in recent times, maybe it was a bit gruesome to read, has found a revived popularity as the patron of motorists. Well, they didn't exist in those days, did they? So now this is the story. This, this, this is the Christopher. So the legend of St. Christopher did not take its form, final forms until the Middle Ages his name Christ bearer from having a spiritual meaning was given a material one as well and the story was embroidered by the liveliness of medieval fancy except that there was a martyr Christopher another one nothing is certainly known about him the Roman martyrology says that he suffered in Lycia under Dacius shot with arrows and beheaded after he had been preserved from the flames. So they tend to get a bit mixed up, but basically the stories are, well, they're pretty good, aren't they? So we'll continue now. There's just two more saints to read for the 25th of July. Saints Thea, Valentina and Paul, Martyrs, AD 308. Firmilian, the successor of Urban, in the government of Palestine under Maximinus II, carried on the persecution of Christians with great cruelty. When fourscore and seventeen confessors, men, women and children, were brought before him at Caesarea, he commanded the sinews of the joint of their left feet to be burnt with a hot iron and their right eyes to be put out and the eye holes burnt. In this condition, 
he sent them to work at the quarries in the Lebanon. Many others were brought before him. This inhuman judge from different towns of Palestine and were tormented in various ways. Among the Christians taken at Gaza, my adopted daughters are from Gaza, <laughs> whilst they were assembled, I'll have to read them this story, were assembled to hear the Holy Scriptures read, was a maiden named Thea, a native of the place, whom the judge threatened with prostitution in the public brothel. Well, that would be abhorrent to any Palestinian. They couldn't bear that. She reproached him for such infamous injustice and firmly engaged, enraged at her liberty of speech, caused her to be scourged and otherwise tormented. Valentina, a Christian girl of Caesarea, who was present, cried out to the judge in the midst of the crowd, How long will you thus torture my sister? She was seized at once and dragged to the pagan altar, which she kicked over, together with the fire and incense, which stood ready upon it. Vermilion, provoked beyond bounds, commanded her to be more cruelly tortured than the other, and then ordered the two girls to be tied together and burnt, which was done. At the same time and place, Gaza on July the 25th, 308, one Paul was beheaded for the faith. At the place of execution, he prayed aloud for his fellow countrymen, for the spread of Christianity, for those there present, for the emperor and for the judges and the headsmen. That is the end of that saints, those saints. And now the final one for the 25th is Saint Magnericus, Bishop of Trier, AD 596. So Saint Magnericus. This saint was born at the beginning of the 6th century and brought up in the household of St. Nice, Nicetius, Bishop of Trier, who gave him the priesthood and made him his confidant. When Nicetius was expelled from his see by King Clotaire the first, because he had excommunicated him for his profligacy, Magnericus accompanied him into exile. They were recalled by Sieg, Sieg, Siegbert the following year and six years later Magnericus succeeded to the bishopric of Trier. A great enthusiasm of Saint Magnericus was devotion to Saint Martin of Tours, a very popular saint, and he built several churches and founded the monastery dedicated to his honour. In the course of his pilgrimages to the shrine at Tours, he formed a close friendship with St. Gregory, bishop of that city, who testified in his writings to the sanctity of Magnericus. When Theodore, bishop of Marseille, was in 585 exiled by Guntramus of Burgundy, he took refuge at Trier, and Saint Magnericus took Saint Gregory with him to plead the cause of the oppressed bishop before King Childebert II, who had a great regard for the bishop of Trier. So too had another saint who knew him well, Venantius Fortunatus, who was impressed by his shining piety and sound learning and praising him as an ornament of the church. He attracted numerous fervent disciples, among others St. Gaugeric Geri, whom he made one of his deacons and who became Bishop of Cambrai. St. Magnericus died at a great age, in 596. 
Thank you so much for listening. May God bless you and heal you. Don't forget to pray to your favourite saint, if it even has your name or one that you love and prefer. Please continue to pray. And thank you so much for listening. I'm sending you God's peace in abundance. And may you always be happy and joyful in the Lord. And pay, pray, I pray, for the persecuted Christians in the world. There are many places where their lives are under threat and they're persecuted and still killed. God bless you all. And I will continue so soon with some more. Thank you.